for those who've been here in prior years, um, I'm that finance guy. Yeah, so my job is to try to describe for you why direct primary care can save money and why the costs, the fake costs that are permeating our system are so important. Um, I'm having Paul's issues too. What am I missing? Point it, point it there. Take that. No? The green button. A green button. Take that green button. No, maybe another. Now the confident one. <laughs> <laughs> Tech guy, I'm making me look so bad. All right, well, I'll just start talking as you try to figure that out. So before you can explain why direct primary care can save money, you have to understand what direct primary care is. Now, as almost all of you understand who are here, um, direct primary care is a membership model of medical care. For a low-cost monthly membership, for, I'm not killing people's eyes here in the first row with the laser, am I? Um, for a low-cost monthly membership, usually about $40 to $100 a month, people can get unlimited primary care visits to their doctor. Now, that is imperative, and the reason why is, is people, when they pay a lot of money at the, at the time of they see their doctor, they're disinclined to actually see that doctor. So what does that mean? Well, they do save money in primary care, that's right, because they're using them less. However, they're doubling that savings in new costs of hospitalization. And that's not only a cost issue, that's a human suffering issue. Um, it also includes all in-office diagnostics, EKGs, spirometers, pulse oximeters. We get away from the nickel and diming of charging for every little test that goes through our system, and we actually try to give people value. It includes all in-office procedures, joint injections, biopsies, and it includes what I think is most revolutionary, which is telemedicine. The ability, whoa, now I'm like in the middle of it. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to go back? At least the big surprise, the, the embarrassing picture of Josh hasn't been put up yet. So this is all good. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, there he is. Um, so, okay, yeah, wow, what an awesome slide. There, you guys see it now. All right, so that was everything I was just describing. All right, so, you know, with direct primary care, we include an incredible bundle of services, unlimited visits, in-office diagnostics, uh, telemedicine, in-office procedures. But then we take that incredible suite of services and to magnify that benefit for that low monthly uh, expenditure, we have gone out and we have negotiated predetermined prices on cardiac diagnostics, labs, imaging, and even for many of us who can dispense in our states, generic drugs that we dispense from our own offices. And we do this to try to magnify that savings. And the concept is we want to save those people so much money that our membership essentially becomes free to them. They get all of their primary care for what they would have spent anyway with the overpriced uh, uh, services that are currently in the system. So for example, in Michigan, a common price on an echo stress is about $2,000. We can get it for $200. That's a savings on one test of $1,800, or depending on the age of the patient, the equivalent of almost four years of direct primary care unlimited primary care for four years of the savings on one test. And we see similar savings on other types of services too, including imaging. Now this is an important slide. Um, I want you guys to kind of take a look at this because I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. Our local hospital, our university hospital, has a transparency website. Thank you very much. They tell me what they charge for these things. They charge for an MRI $4,200. We can get the same MRI for $279. That's a savings of four grand on one test. That you justify your membership in the DPC practice for 8.3 years with the savings on one study. The better part of a decade threw in primary care for free by correcting the pricing on one study. We see this with x-rays, another year and a quarter of savings. We're 93% cheaper than the local hospital, $529 savings. And we see this with ultrasounds, $1,000 savings, where you get uh, two years essentially thrown in for free, and bone densitometry. And I apologize if I sound like a podcast running at 1.5. We, I got the message that we were running a little behind before I even came up here. But that's okay, because you guys are recording it, so they can play it back at 0.5 and I'll make sense. 
Um, so we do labs. You do something called client services billing. We send the labs to the labor laboratory who charges us the prices they generally speaking give hospitals. We then act as a financial conduit to give those prices to the patients, things they could never ever get on their own. These are our hospital prices, four basic, these are not crazy tests, four basic tests. 135 bucks for a, a lipid panel, we get it for five. Uh, you know, PSA, $152, we get it for seven. That's a, they, they charge $544 on one blood draw, four basic tests, for something that we can get for $23. That's a savings of 520 bucks. They charge 24 times as much as we do, and you just justified another year in your DPC practice on one blood draw. Now, I don't have comparators for these, but with the in-office pharmacies, they can get incredible savings as well, and these are just some examples. You can get a month of Zocor, treat hyperlipidemia for 73 cents. We can treat depression with Celexa for 54 cents for an entire month. You can treat an episode of pneumonia for 89 cents. You can treat hypertension, one of the leading causes of preventable death, for an entire month, for 21 cents with Norvask, you can treat one of the leading causes of premature death for an entire month for less than the cost of a single gumball. <laughs> so now, okay, so we give incredible services. We uh, merge that with many, many cost savings. So the best way for people to really achieve maximal savings is to join this with inexpensive coverage off, uh, 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 options, high deductible PPOs, Christian health sharing organizations for businesses. They can self-insure with ERISA-based plans and design them around DPC and short-term policies, which are really starting to come back. They're kind of like the recurrence of the catastrophic plans. And as I understand it, you can now renew them out to about 36 months. Now, before I go into how these things all link together, I want to take a moment to, to break what I call the fallacy of good insurance. Many people say, well, I don't need to see you, DPC. Doc, I have, quote, unquote, good insurance. Well, that person does not have good insurance. They have overpriced insurance, and I believe this graph illustrates this. Um, if you look here, this gray that you see, that is premium. That is what that person, these are 2018 quotes. These are honest-to-God quotes for a 58-year-old man. An individual, $18,000 premium every single year, $9,000 for the bronze. You have not seen a doctor yet if you buy that plan. That is for the honor of having that policy. You have received no care yet, and he is eighteen grand in the hole. The yellow is deductible. That's what you pay 100% out of pocket before your insurance covers anything. And the red on this policy is coinsurance. That's the maximal out of pay pocket that the person could pay in coinsurance, you know, co-payments before their, their policy really does pick up everything else. So my point on this one is if you look at this, and in the bronze plan there's no red because their deductible is their maximal out of pocket. So if you took a good year where, where Charlie, my hypothetical patient Charlie, didn't see a doctor, he is $9,000 better off by getting the bronze plan. In a bad year, in the worst year of his life, he's in the ICU, he has surgery, he's hospitalized, and he maxes out his plans. He bought this plan with the thought he was going to save money. I'm going to buy that good plan because when I access care, I don't want to have to pay much. Well, he's on the hook, to his surprise, for another six grand on top of that $18,000. He's on the hook for 24 grand himself. In the worst year of his life with the bronze plan, maxing out the deductible, though it's a high deductible, he's still $7,500 better off than if he bought the gold plan. And what's really fascinating here, and I, I love making these graphs because I see interesting things, is when he did the bronze plan, if he had the worst year of his life, and you track it over, it's actually less than the premium, what he would pay every single year for that gold plan. So what all he's achieved by buying the gold plan is creating the equivalent of the worst year of his life financially every single year compared to buying that bronze plan. Now, um, to really illustrate how, these, how direct primary care saves money, um, I did a, a financial year 2017. And um, what you see here is Charlie, I made Charlie a diabetic. So he has all his diabetic visits. This is what he's charged in the insurance, uh, insurance world. This is what he's charged under DPC practice. It includes all his visits, all his labs, all his meds the entire year. He even gets an episode of pneumonia, he gets a chest x-ray, he treats it, he gets a follow-up visit, he gets a scare with some chest pain, gets an EKG, halter, stress test. At the end of the year, his total charged rates under the insurance plan 
or $5,500 for the exact same services. In fact, I would actually argue better care. We get same day accessibility, 30 minute to one hour visits. He has, we have no financial conflicts of interest. He gets better care under direct primary care, the exact same services, including our membership, $832. That is including the stress test, the chest x-ray, the labs, the visits, everything. His entire year of medical services. Now some people may say, yeah, but the insurance may cover some of that, and that's true. So let's take a look how this works. So if Charlie were to buy the gold plan under that scenario, under that year, and he saw a traditional insurance-based practice, after spending this mountain of cash on that premium, the honor of having that, and thinking he would pay less when he actually sees the doctor, he still is on the hook for two grand above that in charges. Because when people pay 20% on their co-payment of a false price, what does that mean? It means nothing. It's based on a false number to begin with. So Charlie's a smart guy, though. He heard my talk on the fallacy of good insurance, and he bought the bronze plan. Great, saves nine grand. However, now he's subject to the, under this scenario where he's still seeing the insurance practice to bad prices. So he pays almost 5,000 of that back. Now Charlie starts getting really bright here and he goes, what if I combine that inexpensive coverage with less expensive care? Now he's only paying $800 for those services and now he's already cut his costs in half by $10,000 simply by changing how he's paying for the system. Nothing, nothing's being rationed here, nothing's being done different. He's just changing how he pays for it. And what's interesting too, his payments under direct primary care for all those services are still less than his co-insurance under the gold plan. Now if he's really smart, he starts looking down here at, at alternative coverage options like the Christian Health Sharing, in this case I use Liberty Health Share, who partially cover direct primary care, that's why his out of pocket's less here. And this is a short-term policy, which are vanishingly small premiums. Now, they don't cover much. Again, they're catastrophic. They'll cover things like hospitalization, major surgeries. Well, that's what insurance is. It's a financial tool to prevent financial calamity. The insurance here is the financial calamity. <laughs> I didn't steal that from Umber. All right, sorry. I just had a little sophomoric at times. The, the, um, uh, so in one year, again, by simply changing how he uh, pays for his system, he would save $18,000 in one year. That breaks down to $350 every single week. Now, I went to Walmart and I wanted to say, what can you buy? That's a lot of money. What can you buy? You can buy a 55-inch HD L uh, 4K Sharp LED TV and still have 30 bucks in your pocket every single week for a year with those savings. Or alternatively, $350 is so much, you could buy 1,000 of Josh Umber's ties. <laughs> you know how glad I am he showed up? I didn't see him last night. I'm like, oh my God, that's hardwired into my presentation. <laughs> I'm going to have to pick on Lee and no one to believe it. He's the sharp dresser. All right. Now, this is the important stuff, I would say. Because why, you know, why does everybody care about prices, right? This is boring stuff. Yeah, sure, you know, it's great saving people money. It's important for ourselves. If you own your own DPC, look at those alternative coverage options. But I, I think the next couple of slides, honestly, are imperative that everyone in this room understand. Why are prices important? Because of the fallacy of pr false pricing, a high prices, and I think we've just shown it's a fallacy, we can get these things at much better prices than they're billed. Outside entities has used those prices as justification to rob us of our profession. Third parties have come in and said, the only way you can afford medical care, because it's so expensive, because prices are high, the only way you can afford care is to pay it through us, insurance companies and the government. And we are told by adding this army of middlemen, that will save money. And because prices are high then, these third parties now start saying, but you can't refer to any doctor you want. You can only refer to the small network of specialists, of surgical centers or hospitals. And we're told that that will save money. And because prices are high, we start being, clinical judgment be damned, we start being forced into treatment algorithms, circumventing all your training. And we are told that that will save money. And because prices are high, we start be being placed in restrictive drug formularies. You can't use any drug you want, doctor. You must adhere to only the drugs that are on our, our formulary, for which our pharmacy benefit manager probably has some unseemly relationships with the pharmaceutical company and the pharmacies themselves. And we are told that that will save money. 
And because prices are high, we start getting roped into risk-sharing arrangements like ACOs, where you can, be, you can actually be paid more to deny people care, and you're actually financially incentivized under these models. They are financially incentivized to avoid sick people. And we were, are told that that will save money. And because prices are high, we now have to start collecting value metrics, spending gobs of time, data entry, taking time from patients, putting numbers in computers, and we are told somehow that's going to save money. And because prices are high, we start getting pushed into timely authorization processes where your clinical judgment be damned, you must get approval and sit on the phone with the insurance company, and somehow that's going to save money. And because prices are high, these insurance companies now have to answer those phones and staff up these departments of price saving schemes and we are told that that will save money. And because these third parties have, have made all these staff with the price saving schemes, we have to add staff to deal with their departments of price saving schemes. And you know what that does? It makes prices high. <laughs> Take that, Umber. Take that, Umber. <laughs> all right. So, so. Um, you know, and this is an example. Blank space. Yes, that's a, they're a blank space. Um, mandates. You know, mandated treatment algorithms. I love algorithms. I have nothing wrong inherently with algorithms. When I trained in the 90s, they were coming into vogue. And they were clinical tools to assist with decision making. That was it. They had disclaimers on them. This does not supplant clinical decision making. Now, they are mandated. So they are no longer tools to assist with complex clinical decision making their mandated replacements for clinical decision making. And why? Because MRIs are expensive, prices are high, right? That's the justification. So many insurance companies now, if you have a patient with back pain, and I'm not saying you should get MRIs on everybody with back pain, but if you want to get an MRI on a patient with back pain, many times they say, no, you must get an x-ray first. Why? Because MRIs are expensive. Well, is that actually true? Do you remember my slide from earlier? We are able to get an MRI with a direct approach for less than half of the cost the hospital charges for the x-ray, which means that the entire intrusion into our practice of, me of medicine is based on the fallacy that MRIs are expensive. Now, a quick explanation of how our current system is financed, at least for primary care. So one thing that's important to remember is the patient pays for their care. It doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's, it's confused and buried in a complex morass of payments. Premiums, deferred wages, taxes, but in the end that patient pays for their care. And just as strong of the fallacy of high prices is the equal and opposite fallacy that this could ever actually be free. You can bury it in bigger premiums and bigger taxes, but in the end you do pay but it's hidden. I don't know about you, but I like to know what I'm paying for. So in this example, what you see is a patient pays the government in taxes and pays insurance companies in premiums. And if they're on Medicare, many times they're doing both with supplemental policies. When you pay the government, ironically, the government's plans actually contract with insurance companies privately to administer them. They don't actually administer Medicare and Medicaid. Those are administered by insurance companies and then eventually they pay the doctor. But each step of the way, they're taking a big cut themselves and putting their own stipulations on, the, on, the, on the, the payment. What does that mean? That's control of you. So once that patient does come in, who remember paid everything in the first place, come in to see the doctor, where's the doctor's attention? It's on completion of the forms to justify the payment to the insurance who justifies the payment to the insurance company that started with the patient in the first place. So what does direct primary care do? gets rid of all this waste and corruption. And it takes it back, now watch the doctor's head, to the focus being where it should be, on the patient. And now some people say, okay, that's fine, but what about the truly indigent who can't afford the $40 a month membership? You know, that's a fraction of a cable bill. You know, what about that truly indigent person? Well, there is nothing about the scenario that says that person cannot receive support from friends, from family, from charity, or yes, even from the government. However, what it does is it not only eliminates a lot of that waste, but it keeps the decision making in the single most ethical place for life and death decision making to be made for a patient. And that's with that patient. Not by administrators, not by bureaucrats. 
that decision making is now made by that person for themselves with the consultation of their trusted doctor. Now to end, I have a confession to make. I really love Josh Humbert. No, and that's not it. Uh, that's definitely not it. The, the, um, I have a confession to make. Since I've become a direct primary care doctor, gotta admit it, I've become really, really greedy. But not greedy in the way people accuse us, not for money. Greedy for something far, far more valuable. Greedy for the value of my time. Which ironically, when I was an insurance-based doctor, I was so busy, I didn't have the time to appreciate the value of my time. Time with my patients, to care for them, to counsel them, to comfort them, to help find out what they want from the healthcare system. Time with these guys, these are my kids, and time to watch them grow. Time with my family, time with my friends, but there's one important person missing in all of these slides, and that's this lovely lady here. That's my wife, the pediatrician, who's still in the insurance model of care, and that's because she's here. At our island, night after night, day after day, long after clinics closed, on weekends, in lieu of vacations, charting, 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 doing every ridiculous mandated task that's foisted upon her by the very people who destroyed our system. Don't let that be you. You have a choice. You can chart your own destiny. But though I have been greedy with my time, I've loved the flexibility that DPC has, has given me and I've taken it full advantage of it. I coach my kids' teams, softball teams, baseball teams, I love it. There are an incredible group of people who are selfless defenders of you. Kimberly, Ryan, Julie, Amy, Mike, even Baldy over here. <laughs> okay, that one was low, that was low. But they are, they are defenders of you. They have been selfless with their time. Time spent propagating this model and defending you. And in the end, I would just like to say, may God bless all of you. May God help you find the path that gives you personal and professional happiness. And may God continue to bless this incredible direct primary care movement, the last great hope for our healthcare system. Thank you. <laughs>